Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James Katz. I'm the Feld Foundation, I'm sorry, Feld Family Professor of Emerging Media at Boston University's College of Communication. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event. What is this event? This event is a public presentation within a, an expert's workshop, which is a little bit of an unusual arrangement, but we have experts on this field who have come from many different continents to talk about living inside mobile social information. And as part of the experts' workshop, we have a separate panel called Small Wonder. And uh, I find this to be a fascinating topic, uh, christened by our dean. And in order to be able to put this on, I want to thank the College of Communication, Boston University, for their support. I also want to thank Microsoft Research New England and Motorola Mobility for their support of this event. Now, if you look uh, at the picture, you'll see uh, a photograph being taken by a mobile device. But if you have a little imagination, which I don't have, but somebody who, do who does have imagination pointed out to me that there's actually an eye on the top of this building looking back at you while you're taking that picture. So uh, it introduces sort of a fascinating sense of agency that you think you're taking a picture of something and you are gathering information about it, analyzing it, and so forth, and yet it also, it, the object, may indeed be gathering information about you. So that's a lovely metaphor for the increasing universe of intelligent people and intelligent things. And uh, some of you may be here uh, from the Boston University community because of the advertisements for the Small Wonder event. And we had a very large poster, still is there, just a block from here, uh, advertising the event. And I walked by and I noticed what a wonderful uh, image it was juxtaposed to people using their technology devices. So busy they didn't even notice the poster in, in these cases. And I don't know if you can see, it's rather small in the image, but even the people at the table, each of whom has his or her own mobile device and is engaged with that. And uh, this weekend I had the opportunity to fly to Ann Arbor and back. Uh, and there, uh, on the airplane, I noticed in the seat ahead of me, there a person was busy with a mobile device playing a game, and I turned to my left, and there was a family having a little family vacation. And if you can see, it might be difficult, each of them is engaged in a mobile device, including the little boy with the headset, having a wonderful time. Uh, this gives us, these, these are nice images to give us a sense of how our world is changing, and it's changing rapidly, and to give us a perspective on these changes, what they might mean, and where they come from, uh, is an interesting question. But before I begin, I would like to introduce the dean of the College of Communication, Tom Fiedler, who uh, has been very gracious and very <coughs> uh, supportive of our efforts to advance the Division of Emerging Media Studies. Uh, and fortuitously, here on cue is our dean, Tom Fiedler. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Professor Fiedler. I think I'm prepared to say anything other than welcome again. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing this, uh, the panel, and give us a, a, uh, the public view of uh, all of the wisdom that hopefully we'll be gaining from this. So thank you. You're I'll go welcome, back Tom. here to my seat in the uh, gallery. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I just have to say on a personal note, and uh, this is off the record, so uh, of course I, I don't think anyone's recording this. <laughs> Laugh. Uh, let me turn my glasses on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, let me turn my glasses off and, and tell this to you. But uh, Tom has been a wonderful inspiration in helping us become and move forward uh, in the realization of an emerging media research body here at the College of Communication. The College of Communication, as you may appreciate, has long been a leader in the practice of communication in 
mass communication, advertising, public relations, film, and journalism. Uh, and with the generosity of the Feld family we're, and the leadership of Dean Fiedler, we're able to move forward now on the research component. And as I think you've heard from the papers here today, there are a lot of exciting issues, and we hope that Boston University's College of Communication can be involved in those issues as we move forward. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence here today. And I will now let the process begin, and I will ask um, Dr. Scott Campbell of the University of Michigan to give his talk to us. Okay. And I will thank you. hand him the control. Okay. So we're loaded up here with our... Uh, is it over here? Okay. Let me get this up. I'm a PC person, obviously. Okay. So you don't think different. I struggle. Yes. I struggle under these conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my name is Scott Campbell, and uh, I want to recognize my co-authors uh, before I get started on this. Um, Joe Bayer, who is in the audience, is a graduate student in the Department of Communication Studies, um, extremely focused on the reasons why people text and drive, amongst other cognitive processes associated with mobile communication. Uh, so he's interested in explaining behavior. Uh, my other co-author, Rich Ling, is uh, on the sociological end of the spectrum, and he's extremely interested in explaining the uh, social consequences of mobile communication. So I've got these collaborators who are it, you know, in psychology, in sociology, and I'm kind of, you know, the guy in the middle, I guess, uh, working with them. And it's, it's very exciting because what I'm trying to do in this presentation, what we're trying to do, and this is, this is one piece of a, a larger body of work that, that we're pursuing right now, is we're kind of trying to bridge the sociological and the psychological theoretically um, to, to basically make the argument, um, as I will here, that um, just as in the practice of everyday life, uh, our, our social circumstances intersect with our cognitive processes, and they work together, and they fight against each other. But they're, but they're, you know, they're either working or fighting against each other, but they're not in separation. They're not in isolation of one another. And yet, theoretically, when we're trying to understand mobile communication and why people use it the way they do and why the consequences emerge the way that they do, um, uh, we kind of have these separate traditions of sociology and psychology, and they're, they're not entirely separated, but they're much more separated than they, than they are in terms of regular, everyday, real-world you know, experience. The, the cognitive and the social are really kind of you know, uh, intersecting with one another. So then the name of this presentation is um, The Case of the Disappearing Phone. And um, ultimately where I'm going to be heading with this is uh, 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 to set up a framework, um, I guess I can give you the overview, to set up a framework um, that looks at the sociological, the, what I consider to be the, the latest sociological theory about the role of mobile communication in, in social life today, um, which is coming from Richling's uh, latest book, Taken for Grantedness, um, trying to bridge that to um, the embedding of mobile communication at the psychological or the cognitive levels. So embedding is kind of a core theme here, the embeddedness of mobile communication, as I'll explain. And use that framework as a way of maybe providing some theoretical traction, I guess you could say, for considering um, implications of, of um, in this case, Google, Google Glass, which is you know, head-mounted, um, has a head-mounted visual and oral interface, um, voice interface, and gesturing, which I'll talk a, a little about a little bit in more detail about. Anyhow, with these you know new emerging technologies, um, so that we're not entirely exploratory in how we approach research and thinking about them. My goal here is to kind of lay out a set of uh, a framework with a set of concepts um, that that sort of structurally provide. Um, the ability and, and some guidance to think about and do research on emerging forms of mobile communication with Google Glass being an illustration of this. So with that, let me talk about the sociological first. Um, taken for grantedness um, is a perspective about um, the, the way that mobile communication has altered the very structure of society. And this is um, actually a book that was um, that was written by Rich that came out six months ago. It was recently reviewed in, in Science Magazine, so it's 
getting a lot of profile. Um, and, and I think that it's going to have a big impact on the way that people think about mobile communication because it really advances a new argument. Um, drawing from the tradition of macro sociology, so we're talking about Durkheim and Weber and, 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 and the, the old European, you know, the, the dead European, uh, you know, <laughs> famous sociologists. Um, Rich's, Rich's theory is about, um, is about uh, the, uh, uh, the collective levels of social order or the role of mobile communication in society and how um, it has uh, structurally changed uh, society. Not just society, but also our, our social collectives. Um, what this is, taking for grantedness, um, I want to start off with a, uh, what's referred to in the book as the Katz Principle, which comes from James Katz, who made the observation that you know, something different is going on with mobile communication today. And that is that no longer is it really my, you know, no longer is it the user's, just the user's problem when they don't have their cell phone, but now it's somebody else's problem when the user doesn't have their cell phone, right? And so that observation itself um, is a reflection of how embedded the technology has, has become in our social order. So that it's not just like, oh crud, I left my cell phone at home or I dropped it in the toilet or what, you know, this is, other people's problem too, because you can't be a very, um, you're not a fully functional member of, of your family, of your uh, peer groups, uh, whatever other kind of social collectives you have that rely on mobile communication. Um, so Rich compares it to uh, mechanical timekeeping and automotive transportation, the way that they started off as re revolutionary new technologies, um, and he calls them forms of social mediation Things that we rely on as human beings to, uh, to, to do things collectively, to come together on. And, and at first, you know, these huge clocks in the middle of a town in, in the 1700s and, and a car, you know, in, in the 1920s you know, or 1915s or something like that. At first, you know, these might have been really fancy, amazing, new, revolutionary um, technologies and innovations. But at this point in time, you know, uh, mechanical timekeeping is, is a basic expectation, and if you can't keep time and you refuse to recognize time, you are not a fully functional member of society or whatever collective you belong to. You know, I wouldn't be here giving this presentation right now. I would be outside finishing my beer or something like that if I didn't, you know, pay attention to the schedule and time. The argument is that mobile communication is like that, that it has progressed from something new to something that was nice to have. That was kind of the middle stage, you know, oh, this is handy, you know. At first it was like, this is flashy, now it's handy. It's not just handy, you need it. It's a basic expectation. It's a basic expectation that you have of yourself and that other people have of you, which is what the Katz Principle is all about. Okay, so um, at the core of all of this, I think, is really the notion of embeddedness. So we're talking here about how it has become embe embedded socially um, into our collectives and associated with that is the underlying um, change in our expectations for accessibility. And I think with the feature phone, we were talking about expectations of accessibility to each other. And now with smartphones, I think it's expanded to expectations of accessibility for information and for content. Um, it's obviously not truly anytime, anywhere, but at the same time, the affordances of mobile communication are they're approaching that, you know, ubiquitous uh, coverage, ubiquitous um, access and adoption. Okay, so there's some criteria. I'll kind of come back to this a little bit, but I, quickly, uh, you know, for something to become taken for granted in, in the sense that it's a basic expectation, that it's truly embedded, um, there's a critical mass. Um, folks legitimize it um, through uh, ideology. I need it for X, Y, and Z, and other people agree with you is what that means. Uh, changes to the social ecology, um, and, and so, you know, the social landscape has changed, you know, with, with mobile communication being part of that social ecology and other things like the landline phone changing in terms of their role in the social ecology. And then, as I mentioned, reciprocal expectations of each other and of the technology. Um, so these are the things that he traces out theoretically in arguing that mobile communication has become... Um, uh, has facilitated, I guess, a, a change in our social structure at the collective level, 
because he's a sociologist, and that's what, that's what they look at. Uh, from, so, so, so my graduate student, Joe Bayer, over here, is, is more interested in what's going on uh, between the ears. Not, not exclusively, though. He's also kind of dabbling in sociology, I would say, or at least communication. Uh, considering you're getting a PhD in communication, that's fair to say. Um, but he's, he comes from a psychological background. Um, so I already talked about the symbiotic relationship between um, psychology and sociology in everyday life. Theoretically, it makes sense that we try to bridge these um, in order to explain what's going on with things like mobile communication. Um, so there's, a, a, I think, a great deal of utility that I'm going to try to demonstrate with an illustration today in, in, in taking uh, a perspective that, that so far has the scope of it only lies within the realm of the sociological tradition and stretching it and extending it and trying to apply it to the psychological uh, and using that as a framework um, to try to get a, a, maybe a, a more holistic sense of what's going on, a more realistic sense of what's going on with psychology and sociology in practice being so much, you know, so related to one another. Um, okay, so the argument basically is that just as mobile communication has become embedded at the collective level, you know, a taken for granted assumption. And by the way, when I say mobile communication, I'm talking about a process. I'm talking about a social practice. Uh, Jonathan Donner and I had a really uh, interesting conversation the other day about this, about the artifact of mobile communication and the process of mobile communication. And both of those are mobile communication. The artifact, though, you know, is very dynamic. And, and Google Glass is a great illustration of this, you know, how the artifact can change and become flashy again, right, and reinvent itself and all that, and smartphones and apps and all that. Um, I'm not suggesting that the artifact is necessarily taken for granted. I think in some ways it is. I'm saying that mobile communication as a social practice, as an expectation of each other, generally speaking, that's what I'm talking about. Just as that has become a basic expectation, a taken for granted, embedded social fact at the collective level, our argument is so, too, so is it too at the cognitive level. Um, basically, the argument here is that um, just as it has transitioned from the foreground in society, you know, like, wow, this is, you know, life is changing and this is something that I can't believe I have a cell phone. I, I, we all have cell phones and I'm doing some new things and I'm a teenager and, and, and I'm learning a new language, you know, that kind of stuff. Just as it has moved from the foreground to kind of the background as a basic expectation, as social practice, um, at the collective level, I think it has also done that at the cognitive level, so that we don't consciously think about our cell phones and mobile communication as a social practice um, as much as we did when it was newer, when it was, when it was a new innovation. Okay, so that's the argument. We're trying to make a parallel here. Um, that it's become kind of second nature for a lot of people, like checking your watch. Okay, um, and a good illustration of this, I think, is phantom vibrations that really, I think, reveal how cognitively connected, and we don't even know it, we are to mobile communication. I don't know if you've heard of this phrase before, but um, actually, I would be curious uh, if people would raise their hands if they've ever experienced a phantom vibration where you think your cell phone is going off and it's not. Right, you feel that on your leg. No, it's not. And so that means that you're primed, right? Cognitively, you're so in tune to mobile communication and the expectation of accessibility, being accessible to others, others being accessible to you, that um, on a psychological level, you know, you're reacting to your cell phone without it even doing anything. And that's an automatic reaction. You don't plan that, you know, that's an automatic type of reaction. To me, that's an example of it moving to the background, right? From the foreground to the background. Importantly, it's not just cognitive, it's also social. Where does that come from? It comes from your social interactions. It's supported by cognitive processes, but without the social interactions, right, and being a part of um, your social scene, those expectations wouldn't be there. So it's a great example of how this is both a collective and a cognitive phenomenon. Okay, so here's the illustrative case study. Um, uh, we're trying to use this new framework, embeddedness at the sociological level, to embeddedness at the psychological level to explain something. That's the point here, right? Um, and so texting while driving, why? Why do I pick that as my illustration? Because it's a problem. It's easy to justify research on texting while driving. It's super dangerous, right? I mean, it's as, it's as bad as, as and some people argue it's as bad as drunk driving. There's empirical reports saying that your uh, chances of an accident go up between 1,200 and 2,300 percent. 
when you're texting behind the wheel, you don't realize that four seconds go by to find that lowercase b. In four seconds at you know 50 miles an hour, wow, there's a lot of stuff that can happen. Um, you know, the, the apps that are out, the strategies to curb it, they don't work. And for various reasons that I'm not going to get into right now. The laws, actually, they don't work either. In some cases, they make them worse. In some states where they've changed the law, what happens is people go from this to this to hide it, and it's more dangerous, and they have more accidents. So the problem to me is that we have not tried to solve this problem without first explaining it, OK? And so this is my last bullet point here, is explaining why. Why do people text and drive? I think that's the first step toward an effective strategy for solving the problem. And I think we've become a little impatient, understandably so. People are dying on the streets. It's a public safety concern. Let's do something now. That's fine. But let's also take the time and study why people do this. And I think this is a great opportunity to, to, uh, to illustrate and, and appropriate the, the bigger picture headspace of embeddedness at the psychological level. OK, so um, so far with texting while driving, there's only been a very small body of research that, that explains it. Most of that research focuses on conscious cognitive processes. Theory of planned behavior, very, very popular amongst the small body of research, um, with a focus on attitudes and norms and intentions, things that are kind of more at the forefront of our mind. Um, we're trying to shift the lens to the unconscious. Just like mobile communication has become embedded at the social level, we think it's become embedded at the cognitive level, and that people just aren't aware of their behavior as much as they, as they once were, perhaps. Um, there was a research, uh, a study that was done in Australia that found that frequency of, mobile com uh, frequency of texting was a predictor of texting while driving. Not surprising. Their interpretation was that this is habitual. Our argument is that that is, is a great area to try you know, to, to go into, but that frequency isn't habit. You can have two people that have the same amount of frequency of overall texting. One of them has a habitual orientation. The other one has other cognitive things going on that explain their texting, different things. Automaticity is um, the um, component that makes a habit a habit, the fact that it's unconscious or that it's less conscious on the continuum of consciousness. Um, there's a huge body of theory uh, and research on media habits that suggests our media use is, um, is, is highly habitual, channel surfing, that kind of stuff um, that we're drawing from. And I'm going to start moving a little bit quicker because I think I've got just a few minutes left. Um, but our finding in the, in the first couple of uh, studies that we've been doing on this is that, yeah, um, a habitual orientation to texting, texting with um, more automaticity in general, is a significant predictor of texting behind the wheel. Okay, So there's something going on psychologically that I think kind of resonates with this idea of embeddedness, right? Like you're not thinking as much about what you're doing and you're sort of reflexively responding to your phone or even responding to other kinds of cues, emotionally, psychologically, in your environment, whatever. OK, so um, I'm actually going to skip this conclusion because really what it does is it more articulately, it articulately um, captures what I've already said, OK? Um, I like this paragraph. I like it better than how I sort of stammer as I'm talking. But um, to save time, I'll let you read it. It's in the paper. Well, you can't do that. OK. I don't want to. All right, great. Just as mobile communication has shifted from a foreground artifact of attention to an embedded part of social structure, so too has it shifted from the foreground toward the background of cognitive processing. While this demonstrates a pattern of parallel movement across sociological and psychological fronts, mobile communication also intersects, so we've got parallels and intersections both, these two fronts as a go-between in a chicken and egg style, um, chicken and egg cycle of mutual influence between social behavior and cognitive processing. It is this intersection between cognitive processing and social behavior that calls for an interdisciplinary framework that bridges the psychological and the sociological streams of theory. So let's move into um, Google Glass. First of all, I want to address, is this taken for granted? Rich is a, a, an author, a co-author on this paper, and we had this debate in the car after the paper was done. Rich is like, no, it's not a taken for granted. It doesn't meet my four criteria. It hasn't even been released yet. It's, you know, it can't reach a critical mass. You know, it's not going to reach a critical mass. My argument is this, and now your argument is too because you're on this paper. Is that, <laughs> is that it, it actually, it, it is, it, is a it already automatically is taken for granted. 
in the sense of what I talked about before, it is part of the larger practice of mobile communication. It's the, not the artifact, but the practice of mobile communication that I argue has become embedded in society, has become embedded in our cognitive processing, and that is what is taken for granted. So Google Glass, as a form of mobile communication, I consider it already part of that larger taken for grantedness. So my interest here, I'm going to look at the affordances. Um, I'm going to talk about the implications, the potential implications of Google Glass for embeddedness um, and the ramifications potentially for both social and psychological realms, okay, because they go hand in hand. And these are just a few illustrations, a few case examples. I'm not trying to exhaustively cover all of the affordances. To be honest, I don't know what they all are yet. I don't think we all do, um, any of us, because it hasn't come out yet. There's some YouTube videos that we can use to familiarize ourselves, but you know that and press, and that's about it. Um, so anyhow, this is just kind of illustrative. Um, the affordances I'm mainly going to talk about are the big ones with regard to interface, visual integration and in interface. Um, there's something called scene tracking. Google Glass knows what direction your eyes are pointed in, so it has a sense of what scene is in front of you. It's not eye tracking yet, but we'll see if it gets there. Um, voice. Use of voice, right? We're not typing, we're talking. Um, and it has a name. This is important. It has a name. Glass. You call it something. Okay, glass, um, which I'm going to get back to in a second. Head gestures. You know, you, you move your head a certain way, and then that kicks in, you know, a certain affordance or gives you a screen to look at. Um, and part of the visual integration, by the way, just is that you see a little screen um, in the upper right-hand corner. Um, there's a touchpad. Um, up here if you want to do some manual scrolling and, and tapping and stuff, but really with these other things that I talked about, the voice, the gestures, and the gaze, you don't really need to use your fingers and your hands at all. So in terms of implications for embeddedness, um, real briefly, okay, so the visual integration, what it does is it provides a focus visually um, to both the mediated and the unmediated, unmediated social realms. This is notably different than handsets with a separate screen, where you have to remove visual focus from the unmediated social realm of co-presence and look down at your screen and type. That demarcates the lines separating mediated and unmediated. So my argument is that with Google Glass and visual focus, what you have is greater embeddedness of those two realms of social life, mediated and unmediated. On a socio-normative level, so there's cognitive levels and, and social levels, on a collective level, this could have important ramifications. We have things like absent presence that Ken Gergen argues, where um, you have to negotiate norms when you violate expectations for presence, right? And so like with teenagers, they've successfully done this. It's perfectly fine as a teenager to remove your attention visually from the group, look down at your phone, right? That's fine and accepted. But that's something they worked out. Their parents don't always feel that way. Their teachers don't always feel that way. That's not a shared norm across generations. It's a socially configured norm. The implication here is all this you know, stuff about figuring out norms, it's different. The very notions of absent and presence as we think of them in a mobile context are going to be completely shifted and I'd say mitigated to a certain extent where you're able to look and stay engaged with both mediated and unmediated, unmediated at the same time. Um, on the more cognitive level, um, in the paper that I wrote, which I encourage you to read for more detail on this stuff, we think that there's a possibility for um, embeddedness cognitively, greater embeddedness, um, that could lead to more habitualized use in the sense that cues uh, may become more proximal. Okay, so there's reduced steps between um, cues that trigger you to respond with mobile communication behavior. So there's, there's less distance between cues and communication behavior. So like, for example, um, I think, uh, Jim, you may have a green light flashing on your phone right now, right? And if you had seen that and you were maybe somebody else because you don't always respond to my text messages, you would you know, pull it out and maybe respond to that. With um, Google Glass, you wouldn't have to notice or look down. You know, The steps are uh, uh, visible. Yeah, right. Five minutes. OK. Um, Embeddedness in the objective and subjective realm of self. This is another area. Again, this is not an exhaustive list of the implications for embeddedness. But um, we're talking about, we've, we've had a long conversation now about how mobile communication and identity are intertwined, how it's part of the self, right? And um, I think that Google Glass and its distinctive affordances provides 
um, opportunities for a more subjective flavor to the embeddedness with self. Um, so uh, just to explain myself a little bit, you've got head mounting, a head mounted artifact. You're not looking down at an object, right? You're looking through an object. You're not looking at an object. In that sense, it is more subjectified rather than objectified. Other people are looking at it as they look at you, just like glasses are perceived as a part of yourself, right? But you are looking through it. And in that sense, it's a more subjective experience. It's a more subjective embedding of the self. Um, and a, a couple other points. The speaking, the gesturing, and the gazing, OK? You think about how we interact with cell phones. I mean, yeah, there's Siri, and there's some voice recognition stuff. But for the most part, you know, you're looking at something, and you're typing on it. You don't type on people, right? When you interact with subjects, and by subjects, I mean other individuals, you speak to them. You gesture at them. Um, and you also gaze at them. You look at them, right? That's the interface with Google Glass. In that sense, it's, it's more subjectively embedded, but it's unique in the sense that it has a name. So it's not necessarily entirely just a part of you because you call it, you know, there's, that means that there's, there's a, an it and a you. When you say, okay, Glass, that separates it from you in a sense. It gives it its own subjectiveness. So I, I play around with these ideas in the paper as well. Um, I just want to, um, with my last slide here, wrap up by saying um, some conclusionary comments about um, as people move forward and start doing research on um, Google Glass and other types of technologies that are like this, which they will, I probably will, um, there's utility in bridging disciplinary divides, um, and I think I established that in this paper. Um, the observations here, um, I think, help provide some guidance, right, so we're not just kind of wandering around randomly and in terms of what, what to do with this technology from a scholarly perspective. Um, I have not applied a normative framework. I'm not saying this is good or bad at all. I'm just pointing out areas of implications. Um, I think, you know, there's something to be said for looking at this normatively. Is this good? What is this good for? What is this bad for? Um, you know, embeddedness and taken for grantedness at really, you know, it's not necessarily bad when things are taken for granted. We need to rely on our daily things to work in the real basic, unthought about ways that they do. You don't want to be struggling with the stapler every single day, right? You just want to and think about other more important things. In that sense, taken for grantedness is good. However, Sherry Turkle makes the point that we have come to rely too much on our daily digital things and um, not enough on each other. And, and, and perhaps from a normative standpoint, that could be the case with Google Glass, you know, furthering that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so we will hold questions till all three speakers had an opportunity. So uh, you might, though, want to make a mental note so that there's no advantage accrued to the third speaker in terms of questions <laughs> raised. And I'll just mention, uh, and I'll mention it again later, when we do ask our questions, there will be a mobile microphone that we will ask you to use for your questions so that they can be recorded as part of our program this afternoon. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Rich Ling of IT University Copenhagen. Kevin Hom. <laughs> Precisely what I said. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk. This is a little bit more of, uh, I suppose, a conceptual or a definitional type of talk. Uh, I'll t come up with some of the more uh, so social applications and so on at the very end. But I'm writing together with uh, Diaco, and I'm not even going to try and say his last name, uh, my colleague from, uh, uh, and, and Dan uh, Wiesner Hansen, both of whom are engineers and both of whom are very involved in um, gaze tracking. Uh, the technology of gaze tracking. So we've had this just really wonderful dialogue about what is gaze tracking and, and how is that used. And I thought that uh, in this talk it would just be useful to help sort of get the concept straight a little bit and, and sort of follow along with the historical development so we have kind of that common basis and understand what we're talking about. And then I'll, I'll take up some of the other sociological and, and uh, social consequences at the end. So. Uh, here's the uh, outline. Talk about terminology. I'm going to go through just a little short history of wearable computers. And then I want to look at the history and applications of gaze tracking, merging the two technologies, and then, as I said, the applications and social consequences. Okay. So first of all, terminology. 
we're talking about two things here. There's gaze tracking and there's scene tracking. Gaze tracking, is, and there's actually two phrases here, gaze tracking and eye tracking. Gaze tracking is uh, tracking the point of foveal focus. And that's only like one or two percent of what you see. If you hold your arm out at arm's length, it's the size of your thumbnail. And when we're looking at stuff, that's generally the area that we can focus on effectively. Everything else is kind of blurry and less, uh, uh, there's another area that about six degrees, but then all the other stuff is pretty hazy. Uh, so that's what we're talking about in terms of gaze tracking. Eye tracking is examining, is, is looking at the eyes and following, you know, the, it's some sort of a technology for doing that, and there are different ones. There's the most common one is a camera, but there's also ones that uh, measure uh, uh, electrical messages in, in, uh, in the muscles and so on. So, and you see an example of, of gaze tracking. The other thing that is very often talked about is sort of head-mounted cameras, and, and that's what Google Glasses or Google Glass is at this point. It's a camera that captures the field of vision, and there are a variety of names, point of vision or point of view devices, scene cameras, or head-mounted action cameras. Or, you know, if you go through the airports, you can always, you see those little things that you can put on top of your head uh, or your helmet as you're skydiving or something like that. These have 170 degrees of vision. You know, there, there's a huge area of vision. They're not that 1%, they're very wide. They're used, as I said, in sports and police work. Uh, Christian Lacope has used them uh, different times in his research. Uh, and then yet another category, and I don't really have a good name for this, so I'm just kind of making this one up, is head-mounted computing devices, which is I'm trying to play around with something that Google Glass is, is a category of, but I don't know that we're there yet. So let's go over to wearable computers, wearable computing systems. And you know, def depending on how you define it, you can go back to what 14, 1500. Uh, the thing on the left there is is called the Nuremberg Egg. It's one of the first transportable clocks. So that's a computing device that you could carry around with you in your pocket. You can see the woman holding earphones from 18 what is it, 1885, something like that. Uh, so there's we're going over in the electronic world, and down in the bottom is one of the first heads-up displays. Uh, from about 1918, it was a patent in 1918, and it's a whole collection of mirrors. This was right during the First World War, and being able to see over the top of the trench, you know, was a big deal. So here's a helmet that you could uh, uh, use a sort of a periscope type of thing. So, you know, there were, there's a heads-up display. Going over to various head-mounted displays, you know, we've seen all kinds of different configurations with time uh, associated with these. Uh, uh, one sort of a whimsical one at the conference that we were just at, Matt Kenyon, he, this is really head-mounted uh, <laughs> displays. He uh, has uh, pierced a hole through his che cheek and mounts a barcode scanner in his mouth and goes, uh, you know, he plays around with the idea of he becomes a Nielsen uh, a barcode reader using his mouth, and then he puts a camera in there, or a, a projector to project the uh, results. So there's, that's really head-mounted. Uh, <laughs> in a different sort of way. Then, of course, Steve Mann and ITAP, which is uh, very, you know, now we're getting closer to Google Glass and then obviously Google Glass. So there's, you know, a whole, and these are only some types of wearable computing. There's all kinds of uh, clothing. Leopoldina has, has done things with people who have different types of clothes that sense if you're too warm or too, you know, there, there's all kinds of stuff that. Uh, when we're talking about wearable computing. But when we're getting up towards head-mounted devices, that's kind of just a very short uh, review of that. Now I'm going to go a little bit more thoroughly into the history and the application of gaze tracking. Okay? And now I'm talking about that, that very small area. And this goes back centuries. Uh, back into, uh, yeah, a thousand years ago, basically, people were wondering how is it, you know, the fact that our eyes track together is amazing. It's in, in clarification of what are the mechanics of that? How does that work? And so uh, this is one of the first illustrations of uh, coordinated eye movements. Kepler was interested in the same uh, issue. Uh, but it, it was around the turn of the century around 1900, the turn of the last century, that Huey uh, started doing gaze tracking in, in a sense that we think of it now. Here, it was a mechanical process. He actually made a little ceramic 
contact lens that he that sort of stuck on your eye, and it had a lever and went off to the side. And as you can see at the bottom there, it sort of drew, and it had a piece of paper that went by, and it, it sort of drew as the people went back and forth, just to sort of watch, you know, what's happening. It's it's sort of fun to read his thing because he talks about in order to decrease the discomfort, he used uh, various devices, include or various. Uh, uh, medicines, including cocaine, uh, in order to uh, make it feel better. And I suppose he felt better, too. Um, but then early gaze tracking devices were pretty big things. Here's, here's a couple of examples from the 30s and 40s and 50s, where there are these very, very large devices. Fairly quickly, they started using cameras that would reflect uh, the light in, in your eye. But these were big, pretty big things. These are not little lightweight things that you sort of walk around with. And the other thing is that they very often had to fix the head very, you know, it had to be there. And so all of these apparati, if, is that the plural of apparatus? Sorry. Oh, no? No. no. Apparatuses. Apparatuses. <laughs> Apparatum. Apparatum. <laughs> should we crowd? Should we any apparatus? Should we crowdsource this? <laughs> it's loud. Yeah, okay. Okay. So th these are pretty massive things. Um, but here's what they were doing with them. They were trying to. They were playing around with the idea of what is the relationship between gaze and cognition. And uh, you can see up in the upper left-hand corner, there's a photograph, or it's a, a drawing there, and they just let people kind of look at it and followed what their gaze was, and then they told them to do things of how old are the people and what kind of clothes or what kind of class, and sort of tried to figure out how their eyes were moving around and picking up information, and trying to figure out what is the relationship between that and cognition. Uh, a one of the next steps, after they got a little bit further along, they started doing this with reading and saying, you know, read this, and, and the, the, uh, the second row of numbers is milliseconds that they would dwell on a particular word. And the words that were a little bit more difficult, for example, a flywheel, they had, it took longer to, you know, they, they stuck on that, or they stuck at the end of the sentence, uh, for example, the last circle there. But the word the, you know, you just sort of blow by that. So there, there's an idea that now they're starting to have an idea that there's uh, sort of memory that's available very quickly, but then flywheel, wait a minute, I have to go back into the index and look that one up, and okay, that's going to take longer, and then it can go back out. So there, there's that type of an application. Still, you know, there are these massive machines. They also use the gaze tracking for children, or for, or for small babies, to figure out what are they thinking. Uh, and they, they would show, uh, uh, have a gaze tracking type of thing on an on a infant, and show it a, um, a face, and then mess around with the, uh, in, in this case, they would mess around with the, um, the elements of the face, the nose and the eyes and so on, and blank. And you know, do they get the same type of uh, pattern? Fairly quickly, gaze tracking also came into HCI and design. Uh, and and uh, the one on the left is airplane. It's an it's a, uh, instrument panel from an airplane while the guy is landing. And they were trying to figure out what's, what's the important information and where's the guy looking. Uh, and the one on the right is, is more modern one where people are, are uh, looking, where are they looking? Uh, in this case, it's a, a, a menu system. But that's been used for all kinds of things, newspapers and uh, art and all, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, the next real big step in all of this is that they started making that feedback in sort of real time and getting it so that now the gaze, I know exactly what you're looking at, and real-time manipulation of things. And this is kind of almost, this is a little, we're a little past this state of the art now, but this is one of the main things. If you do that, you can get, you can get people to move the cursor around on the, on the computer, and if they want to do something, then they blink. Uh, you know, th those sorts of uh, HCI types of things. There's a lot of problems with that. Uh, but the, one of the classic uses of this is people, quadriplegics, who basically can't uh, move anything else, but they can move their eyes, and they can do some sort of an interaction with a computer based on, on this gaze tracking. Uh, now, you know, now we're in the period where uh, we're moving beyond just having these massive machines. You know, the, here, here they're still, 
On the one on the left, it's relatively uh, still massive. The one on the right, the, you can see, is sort of glasses-like thing, but it's still the cameras for picking up the uh, the gaze are still quite prominent there. Now we're moving into a period where these things are being embedded very much in everyday objects. Cameras, if you look at the camera on the front of your iPhone, it's, it's you know, down in millimeter size. Those types of devices allow, mean that you can um, embed them in all kinds of places. And, and as a matter of fact, you can buy sort of like a spy glasses that have a little pinhole uh, right there and you can, you know, record video and all those sorts of things. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, that's a history. It's been used for various types of things, various sort of niche issues, various kinds of HCI research types of things, and the devices are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and more and more manageable, more and more mobile. So merging of the two technologies. Google Glasses has a forward camera. It's, it's a point of vision or a scene camera. You can see the scene, but not the specific point of attention. Okay, that's the, that's the state of the art right now. Two, four, five years, that, that'll likely change, but that's the way it is right now. And HMGT, which uh, is our uh, abbreviation for head mounted gaze tracking, allows for more specific tracking. It enhances the potential for uh, head mounted computing devices. In other words, you can see to, down to the, uh, you know, that one degree circle what somebody is lo looking at. And it will eventually enable us to uh, use of gaze tracking in natural environments. In other words, we're taking it out of the laboratory, we're taking it out of the hospital, we're taking it out of those scenes, and it's becoming more and more, it can be adopted in society. Okay, now uh, moving towards the end, the applications and social consequences. Okay, there's tons of applications. You can think of all kinds of different sorts of things. For example, uh, Doctors are using them, looking at x-rays, uh, and they've got a, a set of uh, x-rays that have, uh, you know, uh, 10 sets of x-rays, and, and uh, in this case it was lungs, and, we're, and looking, finding the cancer, and just figuring out how do you teach medical students to look at an x-ray by tracking exactly where their eyes go, uh, and figuring out, okay, this guy is just looking at stuff too fast, and he's making the wrong one, or this guy does a good job, you know, those types of things all kinds of other types of control for, for production processes. Uh, you can think of documentation uh, of, of inspection. For example, in the bottom, that's a, a, a shelf uh, in, in a store. And uh, you can think that you send the guy who stocks the shelf in there, and he has to look at a barcode or something like that just to check to make sure that he's seen it or you know, has looked at all the uh, things and it could be that he also has to look in uh, what competitors are on the shelf, or are they invading our space, and you know, they can do all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can uh, think about talking through complex maintenance issues. Uh, actually, this has been used on, on oil platforms, where the guy who really knows how to fix that motor way out on the upper beam out, hanging out there, uh, the guy, he's back on land. But they just send some, some guy out who's crazy enough to go out there in the middle of the storm, and say, okay, which bolt do I turn? You know, that one. Oh, don't turn it so much. You know, uh, you're looking at the wrong one. You can just track specifically where the guy's gazing and, and sort of coach them through uh, those, those sorts of things. So the, the expert's not there. Uh, yeah, and I also taught the logistics of delivery control systems. I already uh, mentioned that. Okay, fantastic things. These are still niche applications. These, you know, they're, they're fun things, and you can think of all kinds of crazy stuff, and after you get open source out there, there'll be people coming up with good ideas, and, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. They're still niche ideas, and I think this is our discussion in the car. Uh, I, <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to say never, but at this point, that's kind of what I'm seeing. In addition, there, there's all kinds of issues that are uh, come out of this. Privacy issues, you know, that's the one that everybody comes up. Generally, you know, we were down there having a beer, we were having a great time, we were talking about stuff. I maybe said some stupid things. If the people I was talking with have this camera on, they're gonna, you know, load that up to YouTube. They've already loaded it up by now. And, you know, here's Rich saying this dumb thing uh, while we're having beers, isn't he a jerk? Uh, you know, there's that sort of thing. The ephemeral uh, uh, notion of interactive, interactive uh, discussion is gone. Uh, 
front stage and backstage to bring up uh, St. Uh, Irving uh, is, is, you know, that just collapses all of that. Obviously, there, there's been discussions of this. Uh, uh, Steve Mann, for example, their surveillance, which uh, they have been construing as top down, and so surveillance, which is bottom up. In other words, I go into McDonald's with my glasses. But I think the real question is take away all those, the, all of the beginning, just what are we, I don't know if it's a word, valence, us observing one another. That really brings up, and, and that's a huge issue. You know, there, there's the power issues of, of powerful and less powerful and, and negotiating all of that, but just everybody hanging out having a beer, it brings up all of those. Another one is legal issues. Who owns the data? When I look at the things in the store, I go in the store and I'm supposed to find something and I'm gazing and I end up looking for th four seconds at that and only half a second at that. Is that information fungible? Is that something that some, uh, who, and who owns that? Where, where is that going to end up? Who's going to buy that? What's that going to be used for? Uh, so there, there's a legal issue. And in addition, you know, talking about driving the car, uh, you know, I'm driving along and I want to tune the radio or I want to do a text. Well, just tune the radio. I want to do something legal. And while I'm doing that, I'm gazing at that. And then uh, I look up and crash into somebody, or, you know, somehow there's a crash where the question of, of guilt is a little bit open. If that is recorded, then obviously that, the people who want to sue me will uh, nail that down uh, a, a lot more quickly. Uh, actually, uh, Christian's got some great stuff about people texting while they're driving. And uh, so I'm, I, have, have you sued the people who are you? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm, I think that there, there's some, I'm not going to say never with this. There, at this point, uh, I, I agree with mobile communication there's a critical mass. I'm not, I'm, I'm waiting to see that. The legitimation structures, my reading of them right now is they're pretty strong, strongly against. And so there's going to have to be another whole dialogue or have another whole set of narrations coming up that talk about legitimation structures. Social ecology, they'll change that and recipro reciprocal expectations, that will also come. But so just last slide. This is just summarizing of, of head-mounted gaze tracking. At the moment, it's moving into the wild. But to play on uh, Silverstone and Haddon, it needs domestication. I think that you know, it needs, we need to think. There's going to be new rules of gaze accountability. Now, when, uh, you know, if I'm standing next to Jim while he's using his pin code, and uh, we're almost, we, there's almost an ethic of I don't sit there like this, I, I, oh, you're doing pin codes now. I, you know, I suddenly get an interest in something else. How are we, you know, when that's happening all the time, how do we deal with that? You know, we're going to have to come up with a whole new set of, of, of ways of dealing with that. Gendered interaction, you know, the, the, you know, the favorite gaze tracking video or uh, uh, images on, on, on Google are, you know, uh, both men and women looking at, it's usually women, and you know you can let you, you can think about that, uh, <laughs> and then obviously niche applications. So with that, I'm going to quit. Thank you, Rich. Thank you very much. Uh, our third and final speaker is Professor Peppino Ortoleva from University di Torino of Italy, and he will be sharing some of his ideas about his uh, theories, Homo Ludicus. Thank you very much to James Katz, to the College of Communication, and uh, to Boston University for inviting me. And uh, I'm not using slides, and this is a fortune because uh, I was thinking of 25 minutes presentation, but then James told me it's 15 minutes, and it's much easier if you don't have slides to shorten. Uh, so, my subject. My subject is uh, why people play so much with their mobile devices. Because this is a, this is a, a, a big phenomenon. Uh, very various forms of play, but particularly the, uh, those games that are called casual games are among the most widely used applications with uh, smartphones, uh, 
with iPads, with all sorts of tablets. My interpretation, to sum up very shortly, is that this has to do very much with more general and not only technological changes in the way people play uh, and people have been playing in the last 30 to 40 years with some changes in uh, the attitude toward moving as opposed to substantiality, to being steady, and also uh, in uh, the human-machine interaction that is typical of these devices. So let's uh, start from the facts, very short facts. Very short facts is that it's absolutely undeniable that, at least from the data that I have collected, that uh, ludic devices, games particularly, are definitely among the most important applications that are daily downloaded for use in smartphones and so on. It's absolutely undeniable that the, the, some data that I have from researches in uh, 211 and the early 212 tell us that 64, that, that, that in fact uh, games were, um, w uh, were more widely uh, downloaded than applications for weather, social networking, maps, and all these kind of things. Um, in uh, a, a special report of The Economist published at the end of 211, they spoke about 500 million downloads of Angry Birds. <laughs> Angry Birds is one of the most idiot games that ever, ever been conceived. But uh, I don't know how many of you play Angry Birds, but a lot of people are hooked on it. It was 500 million at the end of 211. Uh, the data that I found, I'm not, I'm, I don't know how reliable, in April 12, uh, to, to, uh, in 2013, is 1 billion 700 million. More than one fourth of the inhabitants of the Earth have angry birds. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the question is, the question is, what moves people to use so much these kind of games, and particularly on their mobile devices? One thing that we must, must say is what type of games we are speaking of. Of course, people play all types of games on their smartphones, et cetera. And some of the things we have discussed uh, during the day have to do with this type of, uh, of games also. I mean, I mean uh, many of the apps uh, Christian and Matteo spoke about have also a gaming aspect. People play more and more with social networks. Uh, for instance, uh, Farmville, Zlotomania, and so on. And my idea is that some social networks, particularly Facebook, have a ludic aspect in general. But what is most important in this kind of playing is what they call casual games. Now, the term casual games, Angry Birds is a typical example. The term casual games is a very interesting term because casual games are casual in terms of time. You just use the time you have during pauses in your life to play a little bit, or maybe some minutes, or maybe some half an hour, half an hour or even an hour while you wait for an, air, for an airplane, and so on. So in terms of time, it's something you do when you have the chance to do it, casual in terms of chance games. Casual games, casual games also in terms of what is the most important in many ways aspect of human playing, that is the problem of seriousness. You know that 
playing is by definition something that is not serious. But on the other hand, Friedrich Nietzsche <laughs> famously said that to maturity for an adult man is to reach the level of seriousness that kids have when they play. So there's very little that is as serious as playing, as we all know. But the thing is that casual games are in general a little bit less serious. You can get in and out when you want. You don't. There is a self-ironic attitude. How can you take yourself seriously and even spend money on angry birds if you don't take some self-ironic attitude, parodic attitude, when you do that? And also casual, in terms of, in general, people have many different games in their uh, mobile applications, and they move from one to another as it comes as they feel fit. They don't have to discuss that with anybody. Now, and this phenomenon of casual games uh, is also very interesting because uh, it has changed very much the demographics of human machine playing. Um, with casual, uh, I mean, uh, data are not sure, but with casual games, the proportion of women playing with machines has grown enormously from the period when video games were the on and, and computer games too were the only games people played with machines. Uh, according to the Economist, again, uh, with casual games, w the, the women's proportion had grown to 42% of all people playing with machines. And everybody thinks that it's going to reach the parity or even more. And also, the proportion of adult people has grown. Uh, now, always according to The Economist, the median age for people playing with machines is about 38 years, which is pretty high in front of what it was considered to be may be exaggerating at the age of video games. So it's a, gen a very generalized behavior. Now, uh, as I was saying, this has something to do with some more general change in the way people play and have been playing in the last 30, 30 to 40 years. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to be very, very short and simple because, of course, this is a, this is a subject that would take hours. But uh, to put it very simply, to put it very simply, uh, the, uh, one, of, one of the aspects of human ludicity that is most typical is the tendency to differentiation. Uh, um, uh, young kids said John Dewey, don't distinguish between playing and living. Very young kids. So one of the earliest, earliest processes that comes with, that comes with uh, speaking, in fact, two years, three years, is the starting of differentiation between the time of playing and the time of doing other things. Then. At the scholar age comes the age for games, which is a, a jump, because games are regulated forms of play. They have names. They, they are not, uh, in the terms of Roger Caillois, uh, there is a passage from Paidia to Ludus, from unregulated form of play to regulated forms of play. But then we are speaking of, of young kids. The problem is about the role of play and games in adult life. One characteristic of the, industrializ the, the industrialization period has been, again, differentiation. The more the growing isolation of playing behaviors in adult life from first work 
which is a serious thing by definition, and also by other forms of use of leisure time. Uh, it is, this is absolutely typical of the industrial age. Uh, also with some phenomena, which again Roger Caillois has demonstrated very interesting, like for instance, the total abandonment by adult people of forms of play which are considered too infantile. The, 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 the typical example is carnival becoming a, an infantile feast from being a very important moment of liturgic calendar as Michael Bakhtin and others have demonstrated. Um, 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 disguising, um, uh, mimicking other people's uh, behaviors which have, been, which have been very much typical of also in some moments of the year, in some rituals of adult behaviors have been restricted more and more to uh, infantile behaviors during the whole industrial age. And in general, during the, the whole industrial age, two types of games have been considered acceptable for adults, that is competition and gambling. Uh, uh, the, 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 phenomenon, the phenomenon which I'm discussing has very much to do with, with the two last things that I mentioned. First, the differentiation. As uh, uh, Gregory Bateson has taught us, and also Hoitzinga and Kaiwa themselves, one thing that, th that is typical of the adult idea of play is a frame, Hoitzinga speaks about a magic circle that separates playing from the other spheres of life. A frame, a magic circle. My opinion, which I cannot demonstrate to you with examples because uh, the time is, uh, is short, is that we are in a phase in which this frame which has been thickening during the industrial age, is now thinning. It's becoming less and less hard to separate in both directions. I, I could give you a lot of examples. Maybe in the discussion we, we can do that. So my thesis is that we are in the stage of what I call the homo ludicus, as opposed to the homo ludens of the classical tradition. Homo ludicus is a person who lives in a, a big gray area between what is ludic and what is serious. A, a person who has more and more time that is not completely serious, but is not completely playful. This, uh, this touches uh, the, 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 the corporations with gamification, which is a big phenomenon now. This touches, this touches even the military with the use uh, of, uh, of uh, video game interfaces for war at, di at a distance. This touches very strange phenomena, like for instance, the growing presence of toys in rituals that were supposed to be the most serious of all rituals, like funerals. Uh, teddy bears at funerals are one of the most widespread presences now. Uh, in, in Newtown, Connecticut, um, they received 60,000 teddy bears from all over the United States. And it was a sign of mourning that is the most serious possibly of all human behaviors, but it was a sign that needs toys to express itself because toys are perceived to be a sign of, of, of authenticity, of uh, uh, the, the kid's nature. Okay, okay, okay. So, three minutes? Okay. Three minutes. Yeah, three minutes. So, we are, uh, so, so what, what, uh, what uh, characterizes our age is the, what I call the ubiquity of, of play, the growing ubiquity of play. And if, if, uh, if in nomadic behavior, 
of people who move around with their mobile devices. Uh, play is so important is because play is ubiquitous, is because the, of the thinning of the frame. That is, it's easier and easier to get into play and out of it in any possible moment. It's because play is becoming more and more individualized and partially desocialized, and we should discuss too because it's a very important aspect. And also for another aspect, and, uh, and, I, and, and I'm going to stop, uh, which we discussed a little bit with Matteo, that is the, the, changing, be, the changing attitude toward, toward uh, uh, transportation and moving. That is, uh, in the industrial age, transportation was considered a linear experience and an instrumental experience, going to, from, and to. Whereas our, uh, in our age, it tends to be more and more considered as a series of stopovers that tend to have a sense in themselves, and that you have to fill with something that gives them sense. Uh, last thing, uh, toys. The, the, smart, the, the smartphone and, 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 other, and, other, and other machines like that are becoming more and more similar in human-machine interaction to toys, which is an infinite potential for pleasure, because that's what toys are. But at the same time, they are partners. You can play alone because the machine is a partner, and a referee. The machine is a referee, a toy, and a partner. And this, I think, is in the, the relation we have with, with the mobile devices in particular, a very important subject. And so I want to end with a small quotation uh, that will give you some news about my generation. Uh, it's, a, it's a quotation from Bob Dylan. The highway is for gamblers you better use your sense. Take only what you've gathered from coincidence. I think that casual games are pretty much part of this new wisdom that Dylan announced and now is part of our nomadic behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'll, um, somebody has the microphone. Great. Thank you, Carol. Uh, we now come to the interactive portion of the program um, where we get to have the audience either raise questions or uh, make comments on the three presentations that they've heard. And as I said, we have a mobile microphone, so please use that. Uh, and of course, we have a very rich menu of ideas and thoughts here. So um, uh, I now open the floor for questions and comments. Uh, Nancy. Yes. Nancy Bain from Microsoft. Scott, I was wondering if um, you read Robert Scoble's piece on living with Google Glass for two weeks, because he's had it for two weeks, and he wrote a blog post, I think, two days ago, where he says, I will never go another day without using it. And it's for all the reasons that you talk about. He are, talks about not having to shift the gaze when he's talking to people and all the things that you talked about. So if you need some examples for your paper, he's provided them all for you. It no longer needs to be speculative. You can now rely on him. Thanks. I'll check it out. Uh, just as a point of clarification for Rich's comment uh, with the end user license agreement for Google Glass, they own all the data that is collected by it. Huh. You're only licensing the use of this device. Uh, it's not yours. But just just to comment on that, if I there are other uh, Epson, for example, has a uh, device. So there, you know, there are several of them. So I think that uh, we need a broader concept here. Goes back to Natalie's comment about uh, power to the people. So another comment. Uh, okay. So uh, it. I uh, was very intrigued by your comment about the um, playfulness of the smartphone and it, it, the um, colorfulness of smartphones now seem uh, on their landing page seem so childlike, uh, sort of like building blocks from kindergarten uh, with the different tiles. 
And I wondered if that's proof or at least uh, support for your point. That's, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. And I don't know, I really don't know how uh, it should be, it should be a, a different study, how the design of smartphones in its evolution has really kept in, in, into account uh, the psychology of the users. Uh, my impression is that, uh, is that in, in many cases, in many cases they ran into some phenomena by chance more than by, by, by open design. But certainly, certainly, uh, certainly there is something playful more and more in these objects, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is an, uh, which, which, which has very much to do very much to do with the, with the attitude people have in using them. As, as, as I was saying, uh, when, I say, when I say they are toys, a toy is a very complicated concept in philosophy. Uh, Walter Benjamin wrote some, something uh, I complex. was hoping there'd be a simple concept in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> yeah. No, but to, toy, is simple. toy seems a simple thing. But it's a complex concept because uh, what's the relation between the toy and the and the activity of playing, of the of the young boy or the young girl? Um, the toy in itself is often not necessary for playing. Uh, if if you don't have a sword, you can play with 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 the with the wood or with your hand, but. But, but, but kids love enormously their toys. And so I think that their toys are important because they are a potential, an infinite potential for playing. And, and th this is, I think, more and more the toy-like the, the toy aspect mm. of smartphones, the infinite potential for doing everything, including a lot of games. Very good. Uh, and I just also wanted to give a question opportunity for our audience who could not be accommodated in this room in particular. So, um, yes, uh, we do have someone there, if, uh, Joyce Walsh from the Department of... of she's rescinding oh, she's her just, question. But uh, you must have some question. All right. <coughs> Uh, unfortunately, you. hello. Yep. No, 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 no. I didn't hear. Into the I didn't hear. <laughs> I didn't hear all the presentation, but I did hear two thirds of it. Uh, but the impression I'm getting from many of the comments is that uh, there's almost a need now for a new movement. Uh, we we talk about slow food. Mm -hmm. How about slow living? <laughs> because uh, there there's a uh, the fact that, uh, and I think it's, it's uh, Rich who mentioned that, the fact that uh, we need to fill in our times, all our times, uh, even now there are probably some people who are uh, on their, their uh, iPads or whatever, uh, must be saying something about us. And I'm wondering what it's saying. Because basically, uh, and, and it goes to what was mentioned at, at the end in terms of individuality, uh, although there's a, a, a virtual community out there and it's mm -hmm. soliciting us all the time, so I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out, in terms of, of mutation in our culture, what this is is, is saying, and if, if it's going to go to an extreme or if it's just going to go back to a certain point, or what's going to happen with that? Can, okay. I, can I comment on that briefly? Uh, yes, we have a um, Scott. Please comment on that uh, to the microphone there. Okay. Um, First of all, I, like intuitively, I, I buy it and I feel that way, right? But um, I, I guess kind of refuting that a little bit in one example is I, I was surprised to learn with this texting while driving stuff, uh, the, the University of Michigan Transportation Research, Research Institute, they, they do all this stuff. Turns out that um, it may seem, just in the case of texting while driving is, is one scenario of what you're talking about, right? It seems like we're more distracted now, right? It seems like we're layering more on top of our driving experience. You're arguing that we're, we're 
we're living too fast, we're certainly driving too fast or too distractedly or whatever. Turns out that with a cell phone, without a cell phone, that the human brain is going to take something like 6% of its cognitive capacity while you're driving and just find something else to do with it, no matter what. And that, and that their argument over there is that you can, you, know, you, you can take cell phones away, you can fix the problem, people are still going to be using as much of their cognitive capacity to do something else, and that this is just going to be traded for another thing. My argument is that texting is more dangerous than getting a hamburger out or changing or fiddling with, you know, other things. So I still think qualitatively, if not quantitatively, we're doing something different. Qualitatively, we are, at least. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't completely disagree what Richard is saying because you're you're taking a, a very isolated thing which is texting as such. I'm looking at it in a much general fashion. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And 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 basically uh, it's true that uh, part of my brain might be doing something else. But what was it doing before? Was it doing more face to face? Mm -hmm. Was it uh, thinking about when I get home and I, and I see my wife, what's going to happen and all this? Was it so it's not so much speed as as filling in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the it's not the, the speed of what we're doing. It's more of those spaces that we're filling in, and that basically uh, we were doing other things before, which might not have been productive, but which might have been putting us more in contact with our immediate environment rather than our virtual environment. Okay, we have uh, two people that wish to respond, Andre to your comment first, uh, Rich Lane, because he put his hand up first, and then Pepino, because he put his <laughs> finger up second. So, Rich, if you no, would. No, I, I, think that, I think that the tra trajectory of, of techni technical development is pushing it exactly in the direction you're talking about. And I, uh, Leopoldina has a wonderful comment. I asked her where she wrote it. She couldn't remember. My graduate student found it. Uh, <laughs> and talking about putting things into the folds of life, in other words, there, you get that little moment at the bus station, or you get that little moment. You can pull out, and you know that, that's actually some of the stuff that Scott and Joe are doing. Is that you you have that f moment, and then it's becoming wired in just to the into the way that we deal with standing at the bus station. So you get there, and you've figured out the timetable, and so on. And you've got five minutes. Okay, what do I do now? You maybe look around a little bit. The phone is there. You know, and, and that's, you know, you almost think about the, the people who smoke cigarettes. You know, they, they're going out the door. They've got, they, they've got the routine down. The, before they know it, the cigarette's out and the lighter's there uh, without even having to think about it. And I think one is the just the basic technology is getting to be sort of so entwined in, in our lives. It's not these huge, massive things. It's, it's little things. And we're... Use it, and you know we've got those routines, and we've got our habits around them, and and the expectations. So I, you know, I don't know if that's good or bad, but you you bring up a very good point there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I I think I think also there is an aspect uh, you should consider, which is uh, adaptation to a to a very new environment. Uh, I mean, I mean, this uh, this omnipresence of intelligent machine is something, is something really new, in uh, in our life, and um, and so and so, uh, particularly playing is a very specific tool uh, for human evolution. Uh, th this is really one of its specificity. It, it doesn't serve. It it it, uh, it it has no use but at the same time is so indispensable because of its evolutionary nature. But it's not just playing. Um, experimenting all kinds of possibilities of these things is part of our growing, use it to them, but also our growing able to do something with them. Given in one of the talks this morning about uh, Foursquare uh, almost being uh, used as a game, how fast is going to get here, and, and things like that, is a very nice example that a lot of the things, and I, I, I see it, for example, in, in the print media, uh, when they go digital, they almost have to have like a kind of a game in there. A kind, there it has to be a kind of a, a, a flavor of a game so that people really get into it. And I think a lot of applications play off that. So. Uh, 
playing I is obviously uh, something that's very much linked into uh, into m many of the applications that, that uh, happen. Uh, we have another comment, uh, Letizia, and, and then Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, I guess, Rich, yeah. this is a question for, for you, for your presentation. Um, I was very interested about the uh, possible application of gaze tracking. And when you make an example about, let's say, students that want or have to learn the professional gaze of their mentor, uh, would it be an archaeologist or uh, a clinician? So they can see where his gaze goes, let's say from the upper left side of the X-ray to the bottom. But in some sense, what they have is a map of the gaze of their mentor. And as Matteo brilliantly showed this morning, a map without words is in some sense meaningless. So how can I understand as students the reasons why my mentor changed the gaze from the upper left side to the bottom, and so gaining a true knowledge of this professional gaze? Mm. Thank you. One of the things, uh, you were talking about the x-ray uh, example. Yeah. yeah, and and quite often the, the thing that they do is that they've, uh, for the students, they'll have 10 x-rays, and four of them don't have any cancer, and two of them have very bad cancer, and so on. Uh, and they'll, and, and these people are reading these x-rays very, very fast. They're only spending a few seconds or, you know, a half a minute looking at these things. And if they always look at the center first or they find something a little bit suspicious, but then they, they just focus on that and don't continue to look around. So I, the use of words, you know, in that case is not really relevant okay. because here the, they're looking for visual cues of, uh, of, of some type that, that uh, for the expert will be a, uh, uh, you know, this is cancer and that's just, uh, you know, lost nice dinner or something, Spot. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Jonathan uh, Donner. Uh, apologies. This is another question about the the glass and the and the heads up technology. But I mean, anybody can can answer. I'm I'm curious a little bit about um, whether we're at a difficult moment for uh, conjecture or theory about this because of the uh, who's getting who's getting this technology first and whether the, the kind of the seeding of the technology and the digerati as opposed to teens um, may be complicating things a little bit. I'm wondering, you know, what are the, what, you know, you, you've done a lot of work, Rich, on, on, on teenage use of, of mobile phones and how do you think if a teenage, if, if, if a group of teenagers got their hands on this thing, what's going to be different? Yeah, you know, I, I think the, the, the parallel maybe is excuse me, cameras on phones, just actual cameras on phones, because, you know, those have become ubiquitous. And m uh, my understanding of teens is, you know, I'm getting, this is more and more ancient history, uh, but uh, is that within, within teens, there, there's a, a type, they d develop a sort of ethics of when it's appropriate, not appropriate, who you, you know, uh, and, and there's all kinds of stories and all kinds of narrations about when and where and how you use the, the camera phone. When I was, you know, we never had cameras at parties. You know, it was just nothing you, it, it was nothing you ever thought of. It could be that, you know, everybody would line up and so on. But now they're just sort of part of the, the group. And I remember we had a focus group several years ago, and these, you know, these were, were a, a group of skiers uh, or uh, uh, snowboarders, and they were kind of, Hip hop ish, and you know, all of them came in wearing sort of letter jackets with their hats on, funny ways and stuff. Uh, and they sat down, and this, in this case, it was a focus group among friends, which is sort of a fun thing to do. And they started talking about, well, there was that one time that we had this great party, and John he drank too much and he fainted on the floor, so we took the uh, magic markers and you know painted him up, and it was a lot of fun, yeah. And then you know, uh, and then we took pictures of him, yeah, yeah. And he he said, yeah, yeah, you guys really got me that time. Just wait, your turn, your turn's going to come. You know, there was that sort of thing. You know, this is jovial. And so we asked, well, you know, what about would you do this to other people? And the response, no, we're not evil. I, I remember, you know, uh, were, in other words, they had, they'd worked out some sort of ethics about this. Uh, and, and so they knew that 
in some respects, where the boundary line. You can think, though, about the rape cases in, is it Steubenville? Uh, there, they blew it. Uh, and it had huge consequences. And, you know, that's, just keep, that'll, you know, go on and on and on for a long, long time. So I think that's one of the things about teens is they do develop these ethics, but they blow it, too. Uh, and that's part of being an, an, a teen, I think, is, is figuring out where those boundaries go. And you don't know where that boundary is until you blow it a little bit. When I was a teen, we blew it, but you know, it, it, the ramifications weren't <laughs> recorded. Uh, now, now they are. And so I think, but if this, you know, just one little quick other ramble is, is the whole idea of, of parties that get out of control. And they, they've figured out ways of, of doing that so that they, you know, that half of the Oslo doesn't show up at your doorstep because they heard there's a cool party there and they trash the place. There, there's sort of a maybe almost an urban legend thing about the five people. I owe, everybody has a friend of a friend or something like that 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 happened to. And so that's part of the, the atmosphere for them. So, you know, I, it's, it's, you know it's, it's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah. Thank you very much. Christian. Yes, it's just a comment on the glasses, too. Um, I the, you mentioned very much the issue of surveillance, uh, so how the recordings would matter with respect to the people who were recorded. Uh, but also an issue about the, the, the gazer, the, p the person who is using the glasses. I had the occasion to try to wear camera glasses to do ethnography, that means to, to, to move around people and record myself. As it's a wonderful tool to, to record some actual data in an ethno ethnographic way. But what's interesting, it's a very unsettling experience because uh, you, you, you're looking, let's say, as you would with the glasses, mm -hmm. at the same time you're looking, at thinking about how it could be recorded to, to, to an extent which uh, uh, something that may occur when you record anything uh, that because you have to, to look and, 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 to, and to record. But th there it's so it gets so much woven together, the, the kind of unmediated gaze and, and the gaze gazing while thinking how you will record, that becomes a kind of unsettling perceptive experience. Mm. A, a, and I think a, it blurs a little to, to, to what uh, Scott said about this distinction between sociology and psychology gets very, very difficult at that level because you're gazing and understand gazing, gazing while looking at how it might look to others. So, so there's, there's no sharp, any sharp distinction anymore mm. in a sense. So there's a lot of interesting phenomenological issues with, with, with respect to gaze, gazing and, and gazing while recording at the same time. But then it would almost be, you know, you're using it as a specific tool. Actually, police are starting to use uh, uh, glasses-mounted cameras. Uh, and, you know, we all know in, in Russia that they're using car-mounted cameras to, uh, to record what's happening. Uh, but the police are already doing that in order to just document, you know, th this arrest went this way, uh, and so you can't sue me for being brutal. You know, there, there's that type of thing. But I think th that there will be a transition, though, at some point when it becomes every day, when it becomes normalized, when it becomes, you know, this is just the thing I have on and I'm not really thinking about it. Uh, so, I, you know, I, that'll, that will be an, sort of an interesting transition of not only if you're recording me, I'm aware that I am accountable for what I'm saying in a different way, but also, you know, you in that situation there would be an unnaturalness uh, for the unrec you know, when you compare that to the unrecorded world. Yeah, there's a lot of issues there. Yeah. Just, uh, just a short, uh, a short um, question. Don't you think that there is a strange phenomenon in this idea of the glasses, that is uh, to filter reality through very much audio and visual instrument mm -hmm. in a moment in which there is a tendency on the opposite to opening also to other senses, particularly to the tactile, which has been, which has been particularly a, a, a phenomenon of the last 30 years. And I, uh, what, what made me always uh, not very, very uh, uh, believing in this thing is, is that, is that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea that goes to the, the, the period of cinema. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, we, are, we, we are far beyond that in mm -hmm. many ways. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we're going to have to wrap things up, but we would like a uh, 
Professor Joyce Walsh from the Communication College to be able to address a question and hear a response. Thanks, Jim, and thank you. Um, wonderful talk this afternoon. So I thought that your um, observation that the ephemeral would be recorded, and then Jim telling us that the user contract states that Google owns this data, scary. So when will the users uh, start to push back on the companies? You know, you're talking about the mores are changing, and, and even teenagers understand how to handle the technology with consideration. When do the companies start to respect our privacy? Hmm. I, I, think the, I think the onus is being put on us to protect it, and I don't see it moving in the direction that you're talking about with young people, I, I think, you know, being a little more comfortable maybe and, and not making the transition but kind of growing up with it and being used to it, you know? I would just uh, say on the other hand, you, you have places like the European Union which has uh, various very stringent privacy policies about that and Google has been engaged with them uh, along with other companies for some years. Just to give you an example to show you that there are such laws, uh, in France, if you uh, collect data on someone's racial heritage without getting it cleared from the data authority, the maximum penalty is what? Six weeks in jail? Three, uh, $50 fine? No, five-year maximum penalty for that. So uh, these are very, uh, these do, range, and so it's not out of our control. It's not necessarily a generational issue. It can very much be a matter of, of public policy. Mm -hmm. So let me say, today we've had the opportunity to raise a lot of fascinating issues, explore them in, in some depth, and uh, we have a rich menu of ideas to consider in the hours and days and weeks ahead of us. So let me thank all of you for coming and for your kind attention this evening. Thank